Hello, and welcome to Health and Fitness Redefined. I'm your host, Anthony Amen. Join me today as we take a dive into the world of health and fitness, where we learn how to overcome adversity, depict facts for physician, and see health and fitness in a whole new light. Today, we have an amazing guest on. His name is Denny. I am pretty much blown away by his story about his inspiration, how he's overcome so much. And I really don't want to spoil it, but I want to get him in here. And you guys have to listen to this episode all the way through because I really think it will be life-changing for a lot of you. So we're going to throw him on in here. So, How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Danny? Welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. I know maybe not a lot of people know who you are, so I had a pretty much eye-opening experience. I was checking out your website, which is just a life story all about you. And I was blown away, man. I really, really was, but I don't want to spoil too much. So can you take us back 30 years ago and just give us a little intro about the day you would say your life officially started? The day my life changed. Um, I was 36 years old. My wife was seven months pregnant. And I was uh, going to um, the town I, I lived in. Um, I was um, I was a part time uh, hairdresser at the time, so I was going down the turnpike when my car hydroplaned into a guardrail and came through the car, severing both my legs. I remember when we when I was going down the road, um, I'm like, uh oh. I'm in trouble. Car, you know, the car wouldn't respond. Bam, I slam into something. A few seconds and I'm alive. I'm okay. I look around. I look down and what I saw caused this sudden rush of pain all over my body. And what it was is my left leg was on the dashboard of the car. My right was under the guardrail that came through the car and pinned the right foot down. All that was attached to the, to the right foot was my uh, artery. And when I saw this, wow. yeah, when I saw that, my heart started to, to rush and the blood was coming out like a garden hose. And I'm like, I'm gonna die unless I do something. And at that time, I and I and a lot of people say, oh, I, I you know, I don't know how you, you know, you, you, you're amazing and this and that. No, we all have this. I really believe we have that will to survive. And what happened was I started to visualize. I visualized myself in a hospital. Ahead, like four hours ahead and doctors working on me. And when I did that, I was able to bring my blood um, down. So it wasn't coming out and I could hold my one leg off with a uh, with my hand. And then I uh, somebody came and we made a tourniquet for the other one. Um, and I was able until the um, emergency workers came and peeled back the roof and used the jaws of life. I was able to survive. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it's so much more intense hearing it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was intense. I'll tell you what, a lot of things go through your mind. And um, I thought I was going to die there. And what was interesting, the doctors told me later, if it wasn't for the shape I was in, meaning because I I, I, uh, I took care of myself, you know, I lifted weights and, and you know, I was did a few miles a day kind of thing. If it wasn't the shape that I was in physically, I would have died in that accident. So right there, that is where exercise, number one, saved my life. You know, it's, I hear survivor stories like that so many times. And that's, it's like the epitome of it where if you didn't do, take care of yourself, you didn't die, you didn't exercise, you wouldn't have been here. Like that's, if you want to talk about motivation or internal motivation after from that point, that must have just got you sparked up and ready to go up from there. So what, ha what happened next? I mean, your leg was on the dashboard. That must have been. Yeah, that was that was scary because, uh, you know, I, and, and it was fun. Uh, 
there were actually four young college kids. I'm going to say college kids. I think they were around that age that came over to the car to help me. And I'll never forget it. They looked in. Two dropped to their knees and were throwing up. Uh, and when I saw that, I'm like, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Um, the one guy I said, can you take your shirt off? We got to get a tourniquet on this. Um, and, and we stopped the bleeding. But um, it was scary there for a while. And it started to get comfortable, like almost like I was in this soft cloud. When that started to happen, that's when I really started to think I'm going to go pass out and die because it started to get, you know, comfortable. Uh, and that scared me. Then the uh, workers came and uh, peeled back the roof and helicoptered me to the um closest hospital that was a trauma center. Wow. I mean, I, I could imagine from that point, from the car accident going, being helicoptered out to the hospital, everything's just a blur. Well, no, I was awake. You were awake the whole time? Me. Oh yeah. That's the thing. Where did I tell you this? They shot me with two syringes of morphine. I didn't, it didn't do a thing. When I got in the helicopter, the vibration of the helicopter was because all, all my nerves were out. Oh my gosh. I, I, if I could say I was one millimeter centimeter to passing out from pain, that was the most pain I've ever felt. Um, that stayed with me for a while. Um, but they, they got the, 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 uh, helicopter down, they rushed me in and, uh, they, uh, they operated on me immediately. They put my legs back and they put me in uh, external fixators, which attaches both of them. So they put both back, back together. Ended up with an infection on my left leg that we fought for six months. Um, and I eventually said to them, take it. I want to move on. Because there was they were running a um, 3M, I think it was, uh, the company, was running a commercial back at that time. It was a... Uh, it was a guy, he goes to the um, uh, basketball uh, court, like in his neighborhood, and he straps on these two legs, and then he plays basketball. And these were, you know, these weren't the high-tech ones that they have now. These were the yeah. ones who used straps, and he's shooting baskets, and he's playing basketball, and I'm like, I can do that. If that's what they have out there, I can do that. So I begged, I begged the, the doctors to take the leg, um, and I eventually got my way. But they did say that I probably would never walk again without the use of some kind of apparatus. And I said to him, you want to bet? And as soon as they said that, I told my father he was there. I said, Dad, bring in my weights. I start my rehab to debt tomorrow when you bring them back. And that's what I did. I used to bring the bed all the way back and I would just do crunches. I would lift weights, whatever I could to get back there. And visualization was the other thing that I learned out there on the, on the road. I would visualize myself going back to work. The brain and I would is such myself a powerful walk in the building. Thing. Yeah, the mind is powerful, but we all That's have it. Crazy. Crazy. We all have it. We all have it. We all want to survive. Just the fact that at that, I mean, at that point, like you're in the hospital for six months. Like that's not a short amount of well, time. No, I wasn't, in, I was in for three and a half in and out. Three like, and a half in and out. Okay. Operation had to go in for a few days. Um, it, you know, a lot of it was deep breeding. The one actually, uh, the one that I was in, I ended up another month in, um, they wanted to take a muscle flap either from my, uh, the, uh, latitimus dorsi or from my abdomen. And it's called flap surgery where they would put, cause down in my leg, all the soft tissue was gone. So there was no way to bring blood to kill the infection. So they, they brought down, um, I, I, I opt for my abdomen. You could literally put your hand on the one side and almost, you know, through my stomach, um, lower stomach. And they did that surgery. And during that surgery, my son was born in the other end of the hospital. What? Yeah. yeah. It was kind of wild. That was what? Wild. Yeah. Same that hospital? Will be in the book because it, it's, it's a pretty good story. So that'll all be in the book. Um, 
you know, um, but it was, you know, my wife got, you know, they wheeled her in at six in the morning. I'm like, what are you doing here? Because I was going into my operation. She goes, I'm having a baby. Well, I knew she was having a baby, but, you know, <laughs> uh, I wasn't able to be there, but they brought him to me when I came out of recovery, which was pretty awesome. What? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's insane. The same yeah. day. Yeah. The same day. It was a 13 hour operation to try to save this left leg, which failed eight days later. Um, they had to go back in, clean it out. And then we're fighting this infection. Um, I was in the hospital so long that the doctors prescribed me because I asked for it. I said, doc, because I'm Italian. I like wine, I like beer. I said, can I have, you know, can I have a glass of wine with dinner? And they did. They prescribed me. My, my, my parents brought a bottle of wine in and they would pour me a glass of wine at night. That's how long I was in there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, at this point, they're like, this guy's gone through so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll get him a glass of wine. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they they didn't know. They didn't know what to do. And it's like, eventually, I'm like, take it. And he goes, well, you're not going to have your leg. I might not have my leg, but I'll be able to do things. And people were calling me up. I had one guy, that, he was a policeman um, in a local town. And he knew, you know, offended the families. And he lost his leg. No, no, he kept his leg. Same type of thing, the infection. He kept his leg. And I, I, um, I said to him, I said, what do you do all day? He goes, well, if I'm having a good day. I'll go over to the park. And I says, can you walk? He goes, I need to use a, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, one of those walkers. He needs yeah. to use a walker. I said, what if it's a bad day? He goes, I just sit in the house and look out the window. I said, well, I don't want that. You know, that leg oozes because the infection is all, you know, it's always there. Yeah. It's always oozing if they can't get it. So I said, take it. Um, and, you know, it was, what, two and a half years from that point that I ran a 5K in my hometown. Came in dead last. But, but you I, did it. I mean, that I is it. And that's the key. It's not about, you know, it's about getting in the race and, 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 and finishing it. It doesn't matter where you, where you end up. I want to talk about a little bit because this is probably the most interesting phenomenon to me. And mm -hmm. I know it's something – you wrote about an experience, and I don't think a lot of people fully understand it, but phantom pain, which oh. is a no one talks about. I feel like it's just kind of like, what are you talking about? Either your leg's not there, how can it hurt? But that I've heard is probably the most painful and mind-screwing thing that you can have because your body still thinks it's there. Yes. So it's just sending rapid pain signals to your brain because it still thinks your leg's there, but it's not getting a response back. So it's saying, help, help, help. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Not realizing it's not there anymore. Right. Can you right talk now, about? Yeah. Right now, I'm wiggling my toes on the foot that I do not have. But it's 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 kind of cool. I'm wiggling my toes. Um, I have no pain. Not now. Um, but yeah, phantom pain is one of the most horrible pains. It's like this, the best way to, for, that I can describe it. And anyone that's had it, I think will agree. It's like being electrocuted every five to eight seconds. And what I mean by that, what makes it worse is that you know it's going to happen again and you brace yourself. It's like, ah! And then all of a sudden it starts again and it shoots up from from the bottom of my stump straight to my brain and i've had those pains every day they put me on pain pills painkillers oxycodone i would take those they never totally got rid of them but it did you know um mask it downed it a little bit but they were always yeah. there and when a storm was coming barometric pressure was changing i know you know there, there's no scientific proof they say oh there you know, is there has to be absolutely because a storm would be coming like two days ahead i'd have these pains sometimes for three days and i mean constant i and then all i did was eat these these opioids like candy there were times where i thought my my heart stopped it was horrible, wow. but you know, it, it, it was like, you know, you're in pain. You don't, you, you know, you're in pain. You need to take them. Um, 
I did that for 28 years and it's cost me quite a bit. It's cost me all my teeth. Uh, I'm actually going through it now, uh, replacing all my teeth. Um, Plus, there were times where, like I said, my heart stopped and I was lucky to come out of it. I remember, you know, I'd be going to work or, or coming home from work and I found myself in the middle of, of a, a, an intersection because I passed out. Oh of the opening. Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't one, just one time. That was quite a bit. And the more I think back and it's like, oh, I need to take these for the pain. And if I didn't have them, oh, I couldn't leave the house. I had a little satchel. I, I, I couldn't leave the house because, the, you know, these things are Satan. They are Satan because they take control and the craving comes every and they were creating the pain. Yeah, I eventually started to create the pain every three hours. Here we go. Here it comes. You better take a pill. And I take a pill and it numb it a little bit. I find and this so intriguing. So, like, I remember with my own personal self and it's something I haven't talked about yet, but. They were pushing oxys on me. Oh yeah, I was actually reading his perks. It was all about yeah. I started with perks. Take these Percocets. Take these perks, and I got prescribed something like fifty of them. And they're just like, you just have to take it every day for the rest of your life. What? Mm -hmm. Every day for the rest of my life? That's. And I already never, I never liked pain medicine, but I felt like I had to. So I, yeah. I totally understand. And it got me to the point where one day where I had a beer, which I don't know if anyone's ever had a beer while being on pain. I'm sure you might oh, have experienced. I, I, I couldn't to. walk. Yeah. I was tripping over myself. And I was like, that's one beer. And this is how it, like, I'm done. That was the last time I ever took a Percocet. And I was like, I'm done with these. And it was only like about a month and a half in. I was like, I'll figure out something else. But what was your tipping point? And I really like, I want to know what, what woke you up? What was the, hey, I need to stop moment? Well, it was three years ago, almost. Last week would have been three three years. Uh, I think February 17th um, is when I stopped and I did it cold turkey. And what made me decide that is the amount of this drug I was taking and what it was doing to my gut. I mean, I wouldn't go to the bathroom for three days, four days. And, and it just made you feel sluggish. Now I was able to do marathons and I was, I, I was active through it because I had the pills and it, it, I figured, you know, you do that. And a marathon was painful. It was painful. I mean, I, you know, at, at, at uh, some points of the marathon, I did three of them, three full marathons. I would, I would pour out sweat and blood every hour, uh, you know, mile and a half, you know, cause uh, you know, it's tough. It's plastic there. And you go 26.2 miles, it's pounding on that, that stump and it, and it could, it takes its toll. So I decided, you know, that's it. Um, 200 milligrams of these oxycodones I was taking a day and wow. like, where's it going to stop? And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, that's when the crackdown came and I'm like, Whoa, they're going to stop me from doing these. All of a sudden I'm going to go into a withdrawal. So I, I started to think about that. And I'm like, okay, let me go check out a rehab, you know, a detox. Went to the detox. And this is where, um, anyway, I researched it. And only uh, only 5%, according to what I read, make it through, you know, get through uh, and, and stay clean. So when I looked at that, I said to, the, to, to them, uh, the detox, how long does it take? He says about a week. I said, what's that detail? He says, we keep you here and we put, we give you other drugs. And I'm like, what? You give me other drugs to, to make it comfortable. Well, guess what? I don't want to be comfortable. I want to feel the pain. So I never want to do this again. Yeah. I made a decision. I'm not going to the rehab. I'm doing it myself. And what I did is I used herbs. I used, I couldn't exercise for that, though, that, that detox period, but, um, I locked myself basically in my bedroom away from the family because it was brutal. It was painful. It felt like things were crawling on me. Um, I couldn't sleep. It took me months before I could sit down to go to the bathroom when I pee because it would run out of me. It, that was, I mean, I don't mean to be graphic, but that's the truth. It's the truth. 
Um, but I needed to have that. You know what I'm saying? I needed to feel uncomfortable and I wanted to, to, to the pain because I never wanted to be there again. And I got through it. And I used, I used CBD at the time because Pennsylvania did not have the medical marijuana. I used CBD, which was a godsend. It really was. I used ashwagandha, different herbs. Um, when I was able to, I got out in the sun. Um, and then eventually I got my medical card. And it been amazing. And when I tell you I have not had phantom pains in three years. The other day, and I and I do I do a tincture. This is what it looks like. Uh, there we go. I do that throughout the day, maybe four times a day under the tongue. It's THC and a little bit of CBD. Um, THC helps with the pain. I don't get high. I get to a point where it's, it, it's, I've never had no phantom pain since I started this. And what's interesting about with cannabis, you're your own pharmacist. You decide how much you need to take. It, it, it doesn't, you know, it's not like you take a pill and it's done. You need to play around with it. And it took me a little while. And once I got it, oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, so that's, that's crazy that just, and I want to, I want to point something out first to you that I was thinking about. You made the same point twice. And I don't know if you put that connection together. The first time you made it was your car accident. You never wanted to be in that amount of pain or feel that self, like reliable on people in your life. The second point was right when you decided to detox for oxy. So you actually doing the same exact thing twice. And I think that's what that trigger was for oxy's why you didn't want to do it the detox way because you already knew what it felt like to be in immense pain. You already knew what it felt like to be a square zero. And that motivation from that car accident that really helped push you to exercise. If you didn't have that kind of pain, it was just easy. Yeah. And you were just like, okay, I'm good. Let's go. Yeah. You wouldn't be where you were. You wouldn't have eventually run marathons. Right. So you knew you had to do that for the oxys to get through because you knew that formula worked. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, this should be something that people need to understand. We, we get complacent in our society where people don't want to experience pain. We right. do all that we can to block out physical and mental pain. We take all these pills. We True. distract our brains from doing certain things because we don't want to feel disappointment. We don't want to get depressed. We don't want to feel, but we need to actually that's biologically. That's how we survive as a species. Yes. Because pain teaches us, Hey, don't do that. And then sadness and depression helps us realize, Oh, we need to start doing better to make ourselves feel better. And I agree. It's you take risks in life and go through the pain because then eventually you'll come out a better person. You'll come out more tough. You'll come out with more grit. And I, I feel like unless you're somebody like you, that's gone through this traumatic experience of life, like that sense of determination and will to live, people just say, Oh, someone else will keep me alive. Yeah. And the responsibility of it has disappeared. Right. The other day, um, you know, I'm watching the news and, you know, about the pandemic. And there's a woman sitting there in line to get the, the, the vaccination. And she's like, oh, I got to get this vaccination. I want to survive. I want to live. She's about 200 pounds overweight. I'm looking at this saying to myself, honey, you're killing yourself now. What you, you know, get, get up, get move, move, get that weight off you. Be responsible for your health. They want, like you said, absolutely. They want somebody else to be responsible. That's why doctors, you know, you go to the, my doctor said, and I'm not putting doctors down, but it's your body. You know it the best. There's enough out there to, to, to educate yourself on how to take care of yourself. Um, you know, with, 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 with things like vitamin D deficiency, magnesium, um, vitamin C, these are the things that that actually help against COVID. And if there's a deficiency out there, yes, people are going to get sick. So I don't hear anybody saying or not saying it very much about, you know, get out in the sunshine, exercise more, eat better, 
take nutrients if you need to. You don't hear that. And, and, and people need to be responsible. They need to learn on it. They need to, to learn more about their body and how to take care of themselves. Yeah, I've done a few episodes on obesity as related to COVID and how obesity is an underlying condition for people being hospitalized and or dying from it. So where is it the person's responsibility to make sure they put themselves in the best case scenario? No, it doesn't matter how healthy you are, how much you take care of it. Yes, you can still contract it. Same thing as you can still die from heart disease if mm -hmm. you're the healthiest person in the world. Right. But the percent chance of it has now dramatically decreased. And that's the thing, the thing we lost, where it's all it could still happen, or it's just an yeah. excuse we use. But hey, if I can get 40% better odds, why wouldn't I? Right. <laughs> And that's just the number I picked, but like, it's a good example of take responsibility, take care of yourself first, and then use medicine we have available to us as that supplement to your life. If something happens because you already excreted all options, correct so you first and then get advice and then put it into your own life. I agree. I totally agree. Um, the way I feel is, you know, I take no medicine except I use the uh, cannabis. But um, my blood pressure was a little high a few months ago. All right. So I took red beets and I used ashwagandha and I used a little more CBD. Bam. Brought it down 20 points. No side effects. If anything, good side effects. <laughs> it relaxed me a little more. Um, you take some of these medications. Like I train people. I got a guy right now. Um, that and I'm not sure if that's what it is, but he's been on a, a, a statin, and he's he's complaining about muscle pain. Well, that's one of the things that it does. It actually rips can rip your muscles as a side effect. And I said, Ch check with your doctor about it and see what's going on. Maybe they can change the the medication. But there are there are you know just getting out there. You don't have to kill it in the gym. Just get out there and walk. Um, get some sun and uh, try to eat better. It makes a, it makes a world of difference. World of difference. I, I definitely agree. And I just kind of want to go jump. I know we're going to go back in time a little bit, but we didn't really get a chance to kind of just talk about it briefly. After your car accident, we know you wouldn't start running. Talk to us just like a real brief summary of your first 5K and then why you decided how you ran a marathon. And I, you didn't even mention the best part, which you told me pre-show. I'm not even going to say it. So Talk about that as well, and just give us a little brief summary between that period for us. Well, when I started, um, when they told me I wouldn't walk again, I started my own rehab. Literally did my, um, had a little gym in my house. And about two and a half years, I was able to do a 5K in my hometown, Conchahokan. And it's a hilly town. Um. And it was, it was, you know, my wife did it with our son and she did it with a, uh, uh, a roll, a, a stroller. The whole town came out. And when I crossed the finish line, it was awesome because there wasn't a dry eyes, including my, my own, uh, when I crossed, I was able to finish, but I finished dead last. But um, it, I, I learned something that day. It's not about where you finish. It's about getting in the race. It's not, you know, you don't have to be number one. You know, if you're that good, then you go. That's what you're You're an elite athlete, and th then that's what you do. But just to be in there, um, feeling that emotion that I've come a long way. And one of the things when I would run, especially the marathons, training for a marathon was tough. Uh, because it would wear me down, my, my stump. So I couldn't go as long as I wanted to. So the most rate, uh, miles I would train, the mo most miles I got up to was 16. I still had 10 miles that I, you know, when I went out there. But one of the things that motivated me is the hospital bed. I would visualize the hospital bed. And again, I'm getting chills right now. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there again. So again, I use the experience of what has happened and I don't want to be there again. 
So I'm out there. And that's what got me through it. Um, that, and then they let me, I did, I did my first marathon was the rock and roll marathon in San Diego. Awesome. Thousand. Um, I also did Pittsburgh 2000 and the New York marathon. Wow. Yeah. In 2001, I did three half marathons in between. I did, uh, over a, a period of two years, um, five, three marathons and two half marathons. Um, that was a lot, but, um, they allowed me to cross the finish line with my two kids. Um, now they joined me like, you know, the, the final 20 yards. Yeah. So they were fresh, but I always kicked it up at the end. I just, when I saw that finish line, I'm like, yeah, we did it. Um, but it was great. And, and on my website, I have all those pictures of what I'm talking about and things like that and videos. Um, yeah, you know what? That's why I view this as a gift. I mean, if, if this didn't happen to me, I, I wouldn't be meeting the people I, that, that I meet. I wouldn't have, have done the things I did. I don't think so. Um, but now I've got reason. Um, it gives you a reason, you know, why is it there? Cause I thought about it. Oh my gosh. I laid in that, that hospital bed. People would come and see me. I'll never forget. Friends of mine came to see me and I knew they stopped by to see me first and then they were going to go play golf, but they didn't let me know that, but I knew yeah. it. And when they left, I bawled my eyes out. I did. I'm like, Oh my God, am I ever going to be able to do that again? Um, and then I thought about it and it's dude, you got something here. You're going to use it or you're going to waste it. And I hope I'm using it. And now with the opioid issue, I really want to help people because it is a pandemic in itself. Um, so I want to thank you again for having me on here. I, I man, it's awesome. I, you still didn't mention that you got to carry the Olympic torch twice. Oh, okay. uh. <laughs> All right. Yes. I, I was, I, that's the thing. I, I was fortunate. I, I was, I was on uh, national TV shows. Uh, I got into muscle and fitness and men's fitness, all those magazines. Because back then, that, that's, you know, that's when I was doing the marathons. What was that? 20 years ago. Um, there weren't many amputees. So when I showed up, I got a lot of press. Um, nowadays, you know, with the equipment out there and, and, the, and the people, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of amputees and that's great. Um I wanted to try an Ironman. Now, I've done two triathlons. Um, you that haven't was, mentioned that either. <laughs> What's that? Out on us, Denny? <laughs> I, I forgot. <laughs> but uh, no, the first one I did alone. It was an Olympic marathon or a triathlon in Philadelphia. And the second one was pretty cool, 2006. It was a relay. And all three of us were amputees. And I have a video of that on the website, on my website. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got to be able to do these things and, and use use this to help others. It, that's why it's a gift. You know what I'm saying. It's I, beautiful. We are fortunate. We are very fortunate. I totally, totally agree. And where can people find you? Um, my website is Denny, D-E-N-N-Y, Cipollini, C-H-I-P-O-L-L-I-N-I, at I mean, I'm sorry, dot com. Um, that's my website. You can get to my Facebook that way. I've, I've, I'm going to get a uh, Instagram. I'm, I'm all new at this, but um, I'm working on it. So you can get, a, you know, there you can pretty much uh, see my life story and, and what I'm about. And you can contact me there if you want to, too. It's very intriguing. And just pure curiosity, last two points is one, Where's what's happening with future Denny? What's coming on? I feel like you got way more in your life that you have to give. I just get that feeling from you. So I want to know where the future is headed for you. And then two, just last point, inspiration and advice kind of wrap everything up for everyone as take home message. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm fired up again. Um, doing these podcasts and, and, uh, it's got me going again. So what's what's in store? Maybe another run. I don't know, a marathon, maybe a half. We'll see. But right now I'm speed walking. Um, 
it's, it's not as hard on the body, but we'll see. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it takes a lot of time to, to train, but I definitely speed walk. I do seven to eight miles. Uh, if it's a, a real nice day, at least five, um, on the cold days, but, um, I got a book coming out. Um, we're working on it now. We're looking, uh, for a publisher, but, uh, this will tell the whole story from my birth, which is very interesting. I didn't talk about that today, but, um, uh, yeah, the, the book it's, it's, it's very interesting. So uh, I got that coming out and I got a few other things. Um, I want to shoot a commercial uh, that I have an idea on and uh, that'll be in the future. Um, not sure what we're going to do yet, but yeah, I'd like to give, I'd like to, to, to maybe raise some money for opioid treatment and addiction, um, that kind of thing. And I, I was hoping maybe uh, some of the money from the book would go towards that. But, um, yeah, w one of my quotes I'd like to leave you with, if that's go okay. for it. And that's, I have that on the website. Um, let me, let me get it right. It's, um, the road of life has many turns, but that's what makes us better drivers. And it's true. Like we talked, like you were saying, it's those adversities. That's those, those, the, the pain. That makes it, you know, you're going down the road and there's a turn that comes up and you may slide off. You wipe yourself off, get yourself back together and get back on. And you learn from that. You maybe took that turn too fast. Slow it down. And life's like that. Another one I want to leave you with. And these are mine. The finish line is just another start of another race. I it's love that. Another race. And, and it really is because, you know, a lot of us and, and you know, you, 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 we accomplish something and we stop there. No, 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 no. You keep going. <laughs> keep going. You know, you got this goal and you set out to reach that goal. But, um, you know, if you don't reach that goal, that's OK. But as long as you're moving forward, you might have to break off and, 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 and change the route. But that's OK. As long as you're moving forward. So I'm sorry. I, I keep talking. I can. Keep no, it, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. And thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Health and Fitness Redefined. Don't forget, subscribe to our show and join us next week as we dive deeper into this ever-changing field. And remember, fitness is a journey, not a destination. Until next time.